And uh, lotteries have the worst odds of all, almost any form of gambling. So. You know, one, of, one of the great things about American culture, I believe this is true, is that we, we talk about tolerance and we believe that people have rights to say. We get this with the First Amendment all the time. We might not like Bob Guccione, we might not like uh, Larry Flynn, but we understand, all right, they, they put out naughty pictures and if people want to do it, that's their business, not for me. Well, it's for me, of course, but not for other people. <laughs> or we, we know neo-Nazis. We, we don't like them with the KKK. If they want to have a parade, if they want to have a rally, we understand it's their First Amendment right to do so. We get this. But if somebody wants to have a beer and a cigarette at the same place, we have no tolerance for that. So in other words, it's, it's wonderful to be tolerant of things that are you know, not really a serious issue to you. but. Once we have a majority of people, once we have 51% of the population being non-smokers, we can beat the crap out of the 49%. Uh, and the same thing with, uh, with drinking. And so I always thought we protected the political minority. Now we have no tolerance for them. I, I think you're giving us too much credit, actually. Uh, I don't think we're as tolerant as you think. I don't think the religious right really thinks that we should be able to see whatever we want. Um, not all on the religious right, but some. And, and I don't think we've ever been tolerant of, 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 of you know, even the whole thing about prohibition, I mean, this is not the first time this has happened. I think this is an ongoing fight in America, and um, I just don't, I think that it's not just nanny, it's, it's the population that says, you know, I don't smoke, so I don't really care about property rights or liberty, and, and that's it, and that's what no, we as, a, as an old Andy Griffith fan, you know, I, I saw Andy Griffith there lighting up in front of Opie. I saw uh, Rob and Laura Petrie lighting up in front of their kids. They Everybody that out now. They, they actually, they do. Yeah. They literally airbrush there it out. There are cigarette out. warnings before movies. Have you right. seen that? I mean, it, on, no, I, I think was, on DVDs, uh -huh. when there's a lot of smoking or something, they have some sort of warning. There's a lobby to push that now. Yeah. All right, so, so let me see if I get this. If the moral majority thinks that homosexuality is dangerous to society, that it has externalities because we're going to be taking care of people who are, um, uh, might have AIDS, also it's going to break up the family, which means we're going to have more uh, social costs. So we can go to Brokeback Mountain and watch two guys make out, but we can't watch them light up afterwards because we might, we might catch them uh, the, pushing the, the, the smoke. Diff the difference, and, and we were talking about this before uh, the, the show started, the difference is that the, the lobby uh, behind gay rights is, is very strong and vital and and excited about its mission. Um, the lobby behind saying I have a right to two packs a day is kind of ashamed of itself most of the time. Um, you know, this is why, as we were talking before, uh, this is why, uh, the, you know, the, the, the pita nuts tend to uh, throw red paint on old ladies in fur coats and not bikers in leather jackets, because the response from one is a lot more vicious than the response from the other. Here in Colorado, and we mentioned this before the show, here in Colorado, we have no helmet law, because right. if we did, those bikers would come out in full force, sure, and they're organizing a concentrated interest, but we have seatbelt laws, because people who don't want to wear seatbelts, they're not going to organize, and smokers don't organize the way that homosexuals do or bikers do or other minority groups do to, to, to protect their rights. Well, I need an I mean, lobby next. I, yeah. I mean, I think part of this is, I mean, we, we should concede, I think, that the tobacco industry over the years has done some, some, uh, some things that were a little shady, and I think they're completely on the defensive now, and I think the other uh, um, sin industries, for lack of a better term, are, are now very, very reluctant to take a stand and have a backbone in Washington because they're afraid they're going to get beat up like the tobacco industry was. Uh, and I mean, like the liquor industry in particular, yeah, I have friends that work in the liquor industry, but I mean, they roll over all the time and they refuse to take a stand on, on any of these issues. They, they always tr try to find sort of a compromise. And that's where the concentrated sort of lobbying power should be coming from, or in, in the industries themselves. And they're, they're just apologetic. scared to death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're all apologetic, and they, they don't. They, and, and well, for politicians, politicians it's hard to say. I'm you know I'm going to defend the right of the smoker. Right. I mean, how many politicians are going to do that, or or even the drinker? I, I, I think so. It's the lobbyists. It's the politicians. It's it's very hard for a politician here on a city council or or anywhere to to defend smokers. But there's a few like Nancy Spence or someone like that. But it's pretty rare. I think for those of us who believe in true minority rights, I'm talking about political minority rights. It is important for these groups to start understanding that they can learn from the homosexual activists, they can learn from the bikers, they can learn from these other minority groups that have been uh, uh, discriminated against, and they say, wait, we're going to say we are a victim group and we have a right, and just because there's 99% of you, you can't take away my right. But they don't want to organize, and there, there is that, you talk about the guilt of smokers, there's something about smokers, some who, who welcome the taxes. But it, it goes back to my initial point, which it's all fun and games until it's your dog that's barking. Right. And if we reach the point where the government's telling enough people how to live their lives and what they can and can't do, we'll eventually get to the point where everyone starts to realize 
that maybe we shouldn't be passing these anti-dog ordinances to, or um, you know, yeah, the good old days, you just shoot your neighbor's <laughs> dog. Right, and right. Right. Are, so, you, are you so, saying that Martin Niemöller should have written, you know, first they came for the smokers, and I was not a smoker, yeah. well, so I, I said that same joke. <laughs> yeah. But well, where, where is nannyism in retreat? I don't see it anywhere. I mean, I, I don't. I, I can I, tell I can't, you where it's in where is that? Where? I think twenty somethings. Look, the, the applause no. line that I got was in a high school senior. It was a group of high school seniors for a municipal election in the city of Fort Collins, and a bunch of guys in the back. Go, hey, yeah, we don't want you to spend our money telling it. The problem is those 20-somethings are going to grow up to become parents. Yep. And those of us who are parents know that there's some part of your brain that gets lobotomized as, as soon as you become a parent, and you want the rest of society to make sure your kids are doing good things you, when and, you're not there to watch them. And you want to nerf planet as I, much as possible. You want to nerf there's, there's rebellion against that. You know, I've got two little kids, and the parents I talk to, and this crosses ideology, there is a pushback against this, this the, the foam padding for your kids. Yeah. Uh, the bubble wrap your kids mentality where you can't let them go out in the front yard unless there's a parent like, looking over their shoulder the entire time and um, there is beginning a pushback against that amongst younger parents. I, I, I don't think, see it. I, I don't see it. I do think uh, among younger people th there is a, a social libertarianism, the, the kind of the internet generation and I think they're, they don't want to, to have uh, all of their sort of decisions dictated but I think it's countered by uh, a very strong anti-corporatism and if you scratch, if you scratch a public health activist, you you start to see little shades of socialism underneath. And all these arguments, the obesity stuff, the drinking stuff, the tobacco stuff, there's always a lot of anti-corporatism, anti-market stuff underneath this. I mean, if you ever want to see a public health activist head explode, uh, I, I've debated them on obesity, the obesity issue, and they always make this argument that, you know, in the inner city, there's just 7-Elevens and McDonald's and people don't have access to fresh produce. And I always come back with, well, you know, I can think of a company that's done a great job at making low-cost fresh <laughs> produce available to low-income uh, people. Walmart? Walmart. Yeah, here we go. And they just just, I mean, they, they, and every time a Walmart tries to open up in an urban area, they, there's this huge backlash. But it, it's, it's funny to watch them squirm when you all bring right, that we've up. We've only got a uh, half second here left. Can we all agree that right now every, everyone should grab a cigarette and go out and, and go out to the window and scream, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore? <laughs> I'll grab a chicken wing. A right. chicken wing. <laughs> Gentlemen, <laughs> thank you so much. This is, this is pretty good. Uh, we'll see you on the website. You go ahead and keep working for corporate America. You keep selling books and you keep causing trouble. And you, tell a friend about the Independence Institute. Check us out on independenceinstitute.org. We'll see you next week. I mean, you keep on talking, but you don't know where to turn it off. Then you'd be nice.